Welcome to Dr. G at the Heart of Healthcare. I have a special guest here who's celebrating something. Uh, Diane Logan, the Regional Director of Operations at Mission Healthcare. Hello. Hello, Dr. G. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> you too. I want to tell everybody, you know, we, we're celebrating you on LinkedIn and your announcement of your new role. I'm so happy to see you back in home health. That's your jam. It is. It is. Lots of years in home health. Right. But you're going back with some new tools. So that's what we're going to talk about, guys. You know that I'm always trying to make our society more hospice friendly and educate you all on the continuum of care. So my friend here, Diane, we met working at a hospice agency um, a while ago. And uh, she, I remember you telling me, Hey, I don't, I don't know this hospice stuff. I'm new to this. I'm home health. And I was like, no, you're, you're actually amazing because I saw I Thank saw you. it there. <laughs> like being honest, that Southern Bell telling you from Alabama, right? Alabama. You're from Alabama. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I remember. I remember. Roll tide. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's football season, so we have to do that shout yes. out. So I just remember saying, but you're, you're amazing. Like being honest about what's going on is what it is. So you were in the hospice world for a few months, 14, 14 months. Oh my gosh. Doing amazing yeah, things there. 14. Um, and now you're back here. So tell us about that journey and how that has impacted you. That's what I want to unpack ah, today because the cool. title, sorry, the, what the title today, everyone is, when is it time to pivot? from home health to hospice, because sometimes you're on this road and you need to face the reality and there's a continuum of care. I used to call it, or I still call it the pathways of care, but when is it time to go from home health to hospice? And that's the expertise that you have here. So tell me about that. Yes. So I've many years in home health. That was my expertise, still is. Um, and I was asked to um, assist in a hospice organization and did that for 14 months and also became a direct care provider of hospice, which I never expected in my career. In fact, my entire career, I said I would never, ever work hospice. But I thought in my home health world and days, I, I got my patients to hospice but I probably didn't eye them well enough up front. I thought I knew everything. I didn't until I worked hospice. So my journey with hospice was terrifying in the beginning. I had to count on uh, Dr. G and Dr. J to kind of give me a lot of guidance um, and support because I, I've never participated in a dying patient fully. The, the whole uh, process of signing on to hospice until, um, you know, end of death. I just, I just, or end of life. I just had never done that. It was terrifying to me. I thought I accepted death. I've, I thought I accepted my own death. I thought it was, it's a part of life. We all have an expiration tax. So all these thoughts are in my head that it's gotta be easy to do that, right? We're all, we're all gonna, gonna have that tag and we're all gonna go to the corner at some day in our life, Right. But I realized how little I knew until I actually started really participating in hospice care and understanding what the needs of the patients are. And I always put it this way. Um, so many times in that 14 months, I would get a patient and it was a we're going to have to do this right now. They're on death's door. They're going now. Mm. Diane, get out. Mm. there. And I would uh. get out there and I, and I tell my home health nurses today, take everything in the room throw it on the ceiling. And there it is. And that's what you just walked into is nothing is stable in the house. Everything's up. Everybody's agitated. Everybody's got drama. The patient is probably not comfortable at mm. that point, just getting released from the facility, the transport home, getting into the bed. It might take me a couple hours to get my medications on board. Everything's up because it's so unexpected. They were in the hospital and told you're done. You know, you've got an hour a day, maybe a week. So many times I would see that and you give me a day with the patient, everything's still up in the air. But I noticed the more time I had with that family, even if they were given, you don't have much time, everything from the ceiling, it just started coming down. Give me a couple of days, it's down. Gave me a week, coming down. You give me two weeks, it's, it's pretty good. You gave me three to six months, it was, everything was stabilized again. And the patient understood, the family understood. And I think that was the impact hospice had for me. It's not about the process of just helping them get to the end point. It's that 
whole family situation and getting them to settle down and the patient and family to accept the process and accept what hospice can actually do for you, which I don't think in home health, all those years, I ever recognized that. I knew what hospice did to a point, but I hadn't done it. So I was able to do it. And I just noticed, you know, we got to get that. If we can have enough time to get that drama down, it's so much easier for everybody. Me, the nurse, the family, the patient. Um, sometimes you're going to have those cases where it is a right now because they ended treatment. I had a younger lady that that happened. She she fought till the very end and we had less than 48 hours with her. And so we were all up on the ceiling again, but we understood that because she really fought. Um, but a lot of times I think we have a little bit more time. Um I did a poll with some home health nurses recently and asked them, I said, you guys know how to refer to hospice when your patient's ready? Oh, yeah, yeah, they know. And I go, no, you don't. You don't know anything. <laughs> You'll know when you actually are able to work in hospice. And I'm, I'm really trying to align here at Mission that relationship between home health and hospice and having mm -hmm. my nurses do joint business with a hospice nurse just so they can start recognizing signs a little bit earlier. I think that's what we don't get is that home health patient we've been seeing maybe for months, we're just not catching those signs up quick enough that maybe it's time to do another level of care and do a referral and just do an evaluation. Let's see what we've got going on. Oh my gosh. I, I love that. And I just learned so much from you. I got excited. You see, I have my, <laughs> my cup here. You see my cup? This I do. I love it. My spirit animal. I'm going to Beyonce this week, everybody. The queen. I, I, you're, yes. I, I'm getting <laughs> Renaissance ready, but wait a minute. Yeah, she said my daddy, Alabama. <laughs> so what you just said in that analogy, everything's thrown up in the ceiling and then it gets settled the more time they're in hospice. That yep. is like, that gives me kind of little chills, excited, excited chills, I should say, because that's what, what it's about. The median stay is 18 days. Why? Because upstream... Uh, a lot of things are happening. You know, you have mm -hmm. us physicians, non-hospice physicians are not referring sooner, or maybe they're afraid to face death themselves or let go of their primary care patients. And then you have families who don't understand what hospice care does, or they're not facing mm -hmm. demise. People don't want to do that in our society until they're forced to. So I love how you said that. So we can empower your home health nurses to recognize the signs and get the people the level of care that will best serve them. Right. So I'm glad you guys have that at mission. Yes, we do. Yes. And I'm going to work with them and try to really do that, that middle program of, um, Maybe they're not ready today to sign up for hospice, but maybe hospice can talk to them or the home health nurses. If I can educate um, us a little bit more with my experience, maybe we can have that conversation a little bit sooner because, you, you know, you get the excuses of why they're not going to go to hospice. Um, the big one is because they're going to just put me in the corner and give me morphine and I'm going to die. And I discovered that is not the case working in hospice. Um, I'm going to lose my best nurse, my home health nurse. And, it, you know, and I've thought a lot about that. I had that myself as a home health nurse where a patient didn't want to go because they wanted me to be their hospice provider also. And I couldn't. Now I can, but I couldn't back then. And my answer to that is, you know, work with the hospice nurses. They are the most compassionate and empathetic nurses I have ever met. A home health nurse, we're restorative. We're on the move, I say. You know, we're going to get that wound taken care of, that infusion, um, help you relearn a skill. We're going to be on the move because we're restoring you. But in hospice, it, it settles down and they spend more time talking about spirituality, um, the grieving process, family. Um, it's, it's a whole different psychosocial environment to be in. So I always, and now I'm encouraging them to let them meet a hospice nurse. Um, and that hospice nurse, and I will say, they said, well, hospice nurse don't have skills. That's a fallacy, huge fallacy. Um, we do have skills. And I was doing a wound vac a couple of weeks ago on a hospice patient who needed it. We mm -hmm. can do infusion. We can do sub-Q infusion. We're doing wound care all the time. So the, the skills are not going away in hospice. I think you just have more time to spend with the patient to do those skills and talk them through. I mean, we know in hospice, our wound is probably not going to close or heal. We know that, but we can still do comfort care to keep it where it's at comfort level for the patient. So you know, that's a fallacy to me. A, a hospice nurse does have skills. They do have, yeah. they do have good medical skills. They do. do. They it. are yes. like, they're like yes. MacGyver. I'm aging myself, right? It's like, 
imagine, you know, that wound, for instance, that will not close a stage four sacral mm -hmm. ulcer. We're managing the pain. We're preventing infection. So this doesn't turn into, um, you know, an inf cellulitis right. and sepsis, and then they die sooner. We have super pubic catheters that mm -hmm. have to be fixed. I mean, and you're just at the bedside with your bag. So tell me how many of you nurses who are putting down the hospice nurses, if you could just go with a bag and do all that stuff, I bet <laughs> you can't. <laughs> yeah. I'll, anyway, but yeah, you guys should listen to my episode about the interdisciplinary team core members, the registered nurse, and you will see what they do. And, and I went live with hospice nurse Shelly on Instagram and we talked about it. She is Oh, she's such, such a beautiful lady in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, and she is has the mission to restore the art of nursing. And so she puts out these tips for hospice nurses, and and it's just it's just fabulous. So anyway, thank you for sharing that. So do you have maybe a few tips that anyone listening, you know, the the patients, the families, or clinicians? When we refer someone to home health, what are some maybe red flags or some tips or things they should be looking right. for to know that they're ready? So I, I think on my level right now, I review HMPs that are, are coming in for a home health evaluation for referral. And I'm already picking up. I'm like, I find myself looking for the albumin level like instantly. So that was <laughs> that's my hospice training. But, you know, that's on the administrative side. But on the bedside, um, I think it's just the patient, the treatment's not working anymore. And maybe they're continuing to go and they're getting more fatigued and wondering when it's going to end and they're not getting better. And I think that's one thing a home health nurse can definitely pick up on is our patients continuing to get whatever treatment is prescribed and it's becoming a burden to them and it's becoming more difficult. And the patient may resist. They may start missing visits. Maybe they start missing dialysis treatments even. Um, they're tired. And I think that's one indicator. And I think having that open conversation with them at that point um, just open it up. Hey, I, I noticed you've been missing your treatments. You know, you want to talk to me about it? What's going on with that? And I think maybe directing the conversation with that one. The second one is um, the rehospitalization rate is, is very high in a pre-hospice patient. They keep going into the ER. They keep going into the hospital. Um, and it's hard to get their symptoms under control. So just kind of that, especially the sepsis patients, it's just repeated, repeated, repeated. Um, so I think as a home health nurse, looking at your patients that have that um, mentality of just having to go back in, they can't breathe, they keep going in. Um, they're no longer, they're nauseated and vomiting all the time. They keep going back in. And then that decline in, in physical um, and mental status. You just start seeing them coming down a little bit. They're not eating as much or at all. Um, they used to get up and do some mobility. Now they're doing zero mobility and they're in bed. It's another indicator that we can see. And then of course it's losing hope and they just don't want to do it anymore. And a lot of families are very uncomfortable when their loved one that they've been helping and taking care of through this disease process say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do it. And the family's often resistant saying, oh, no, you can't give up. You can't give up. Um, and the home health nurse has to, you know, be able to understand the family's going to have some resistance possibly because they've been in the fight for so long along with their loved one. So I think it's just that open listening when the patient says, I don't want to do this anymore. And of course, it's the constant infections that just we just can't treat. Um, and I think once we know when they have especially a, like a really bad cancer diagnosis, I think nurses kind of recognize, even the home health nurse is going to recognize it's just not working and there's going to come a point. And I think just, again, kind of bringing up that conversation with the patient with, you know, how do you feel about this? How about your treatment? Do you feel like it's working for you? So a lot of it's just more about recognizing it and then open communication and listening to the patient. And I think we need to understand and on the home health side, which is going to be my goal, is to teach them about the Medicare hospice benefit. 14 months ago, if you had said the word KPS to me, I would have gone, what? Who? <laughs> you know, and I and I don't think we know all of those tools in the home health world. We don't use them as, as much. I mean, we're not going to do a BMI. We're not going to do um, the, the arm circumference. We're, we, that's just not in our, our wheelhouse. We don't do it on a regular basis. And then the fast scale. I don't even think we routinely see the fast scale. So I think teaching that language 
to understand the Medicare benefit for hospice is imp important. I think they need to know that and have their resources ready. If the patient wants to talk to a social worker, a counselor, maybe they want to head straight to the chaplain just for a quick talk. Um, and then understanding the, the myths, I, I call them the myths about hospice that patients and people actually believe and trying to listen and combat the myths that aren't reality. That's good. That is so, yes. that's such wonderful education for them. And, and we, I'll put a link to some of those tools in the show notes, okay. you know, the fast scale, the uh, KPS, PPS, um, and some of the other things you mentioned, because we don't really talk about that in primary care. I did primary care before, obviously, in residency, internal medicine, but we're not dealing with those things. We would see maybe an ECOG on an oncology okay. note, um, but it's not something we're yeah. thinking about. And so for anyone listening, it may be time to move over. If I could put it simply, when your body is slowing down, mm -hmm. when your body's slowing down, and so you may need a new level of care, health care, right. hospice care. Hospice is health care. I'm always going to say that the title of the show is the heart of health care, because I believe hospice is the heart of health care. So there comes a time when you need that level of care because the other ones ain't working. Yeah. Like they had just yeah. told us. And it's not that you know, it's scary. And I don't want to make light of that right. for folks. People are afraid of the end and the unknown. Um, but it's also important for you to know what's going on so you can make informed decisions and get your family right. ready. And so everything's not on the ceiling, yeah, on the ceiling. when you go <laughs> and, and you, your, your family, it's, it's really, you know, we can't say it enough. We see it all the time. Like I have over my shoulder, this little Camus little bottle. It's from just a beautiful story. I have, I have a couple, they didn't buy me Camus, by the way. Don't no one think I got any kickbacks <laughs> here. It's my bottle. Someone just did an arts and craft, but um, I have a bunch of little trinkets around. Like I have dozens of plants at my house from one, one caregiver giving me just a small plant and it's perpetuated wow. into this beautiful oh, nice. thing. And so that's the beauty we see in end of life care and hospice care. But what, what I want you to take from this episode is understanding the continuum of care, the last maybe five, maybe 10 years of life, maybe two years of life when things are slowing down and to be able to recognize it and make, make your decision and plan those things out. So, yeah. Yeah. I talked to my husband a lot about, I'm from the South. Um, <laughs> and we talk about, I, I think death is just something we talk about more down there. And I don't know what culturally where that comes from, but I mean, I can tell you right now, every family member I have their, their, their plan, what they want, where they want to be buried, how they want their funeral. It's a dinner table conversation that we talk about it. And when I met my husband, who's from Chicago, it, it terrified him that I would talk openly about, well, you don't have to worry about being on machines for long because I'm not going to let you. And, and that was very uncomfortable conversations for him mm. uh, being a, you know, from the North and all about talking about that. Now it's, it's a very comfort level and he's got his plans at the uh, military cemetery. So it's that comfort level of just being able to talk about it. Um, and families just don't do that. I mean, I can't tell you how many families as hospice I've gone on to and they, they have nothing planned. And I, I mean, their loved one has end stage cancer and they don't have a mortuary plan. And I'm like, you got to find one or I'm going to have to help you find one, but I want it to be what you culturally, spiritually, what you would like. And I literally had that conversation on a death visit. They called me and she had passed and I was on my way. And I said, I talked to the daughter-in-law and I said, you've got to get me some somebody to call by the time I get there, just talk to the family. And the day before the husband walked away from me, when I asked him that information, when his wife was clearly actively dying. Um, oh. And again, I have four days with that, that patient, four days. If I'd had mm. two weeks, I might have gotten a little bit more information, but oh. she made the final decision. She was still in treatment and she woke up on a Saturday and told her husband, I'm not doing this anymore. And her husband called me and we admitted her about three hours later, cold call. It was a cold call to the agency. Um, and 
she was, you know, fighting cancer the right way. She had breast met stout. And, um, but I just remember just having to tell the daughter-in-law, you, you've got to find a place for me that fits for you guys. So having those conversations a little bit more sooner than on your way to the death visit is really, I think, good. And then it flows a little bit smoother and everybody kind of understands what the patient may have desired. Wow. Yeah. And that's the skill set everyone, you heard this word conversation. <laughs> um, so I'm going to highlight some of my favorite people in the community, the conversation project. Um, they have great tools out there to help families have conversations with their healthcare team, have conversations with their family, and also another tool, the death deck yes, or the end of life deck. I actually just reviewed it over the weekend when my family was in town and um, it's fabulous just to get the conversation going. So that's the skill set that hospice and palliative care uh, providers, physicians, nurses that we mm -hmm. do. That's our skill set. That is in our toolkit to be able to have what they call difficult conversations, but they're they're easy for us because we're comfortable in the space. And so I'm going to put a link to those okay. um, end of life notes end of life deck, I should say. I wish I had them handy to show. wonder if they're in my purse right here still. But uh, that's what I want people to do, to learn how to get comfortable with these conversations and our nurses to also right. become com comfortable. And let's go upstream a little bit more uh, to the physicians. Um, and there's many resources for you out there like CAPC, uh, the Center to Advance Palliative Care, and listening to this podcast. So... Let me look at my notes from when we talked. I remember you said, um, well, you already mentioned how people don't want to let their home health nurse go right. because, you know, they love home care. That's what I see it as. They love home care and they're craving community because they've probably been in and out of the hospital, mm -hmm. just unstable everywhere. So they get that. And um I love that. So we hope that after everyone listens to this, that you're able to choose um, hospice care sooner, um, that you know the signs to look for in your family, and maybe just just keep your keep your mind open to the options that are out there, um, so that we can not have a median length of stay of 18 days. Right. Like the benefit, the hospice Medicare benefit is for people with a prognosis of six months or less. And then, you know, obviously we can recertify for unlimited benefit periods. We're not going to kick you to the curb, um, but the benefit is there for you to use. And so we hope that more people can do it. I remember you shared that when you first came back to home health, you had a few deaths and that's when you're like, hey, wait, uh -oh, hey. <laughs> we need to get this together. Correct. And, that, and that's what I hope people are seeing from this, that they want to educate their teams also. Right. And there's there's risk factors we can look at. We have different different tools um, and different EMR systems that can run risk factors or predictive, um, which is a, a, a big term. I talked to somebody yesterday, um, a lot of predictive work happening on identifying hospice patients. Um if we can get kind of those going and get that conversation open a little bit more with our home health uh, personnel, maybe even talk to the home health primary care doctor and say, hey, you know, the patient's really scoring pretty high, high risk for a hospice eval. What do you think? Um, so I think we're going to see more tools in the next uh, one to two years. We don't want patients to die on home health without the benefit of hospice services because I can't get them the counseling, the bereavement, the chaplain. I can't get them anything if they they die on my service because it, it, we don't have that. It's just we just don't have that ability. So we have to refer them to uh, probably a, more of a community type support system if we we can find one um, to get them out there. And then the, you know, we certainly, hopefully some patients do of course want to die in a facility, but most don't from my experience. So how do we keep them at home? I mean, I, I work for a company luckily that has both sides of service. So their home health nurse, I think you're right. It's about the stability that home health nurse is coming to their house or their aide or their PT two times a week. And they've been doing it for six weeks. So they've gotten accustomed stability in a life that's not stable. My, my nurse comes every Wednesday at nine and all of a sudden we're talking, you're going to another level of service and you're going to get a new person to come to your home. Um, so I think you're right. I think it's about stability and just encouraging the home health nurse can always 
come visit you. They won't be your nurse anymore. They can't provide the hospice care unless you, you find the unicorn like myself that can do both lines of service now. Right. But, but, you know, and I've had patients in the past that, that, that was it with me. I had to beg them to sign up for hospice. Well, you won't be my nurse anymore. No, but you're going to get a hospice nurse and, you know, I can come visit you. And they, they often asked before they passed away. And I did go visit a couple of them. And that was in my years as a home health nurse. And they were getting excellent care from, from different hospice providers. So, just kind of mm-hmm. understanding that. And, you know, it's a difficult conversation to have with a patient. Um, it's it, very difficult to say, I think this is it. Um, I can't control your pain. Your treatment's not working. It's, it's a really, I think I'm very confident that if a, one of my nurses is struggling, I can go help them have that conversation. Um, but it's, it's a, it took me 14 months of learning it straight on um, to understand the importance of moving over a level of care services so they can get the appropriate level of care service. And sometimes a hospice patient needs to come back to home health. I mean, face it, they got better. I'm, yeah. I think we're admitting one this week that got better. Um, yeah. And so she got to the doctor, got a face-to-face and, and she needs wound care. So she's coming back appropriately to home health. So we can't slide those patients back and forth. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. I'm so grateful that you had that sit in hospice I and too. I met you. And uh, I don't know if you had anything that you want to close out, but I think we covered everything yeah. here. Your football team, my team, <laughs> we're, we're, we're all in there. So thank yes. you for joining me and congratulations again on your new role as the director of operations in the region. Thank and thank you for all you're going to do to educate the nurses and the community is going to make everything better. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited that I got the experience and I can recognize and now really, really be supportive of uh, patients moving into a palliative hospice comfort care situation. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming Thanks, to Dr. the G. show. Thank All you. right. Cheers. Peace Cheers. everyone. <laughs> So I turn off this camera and then we just keep on yapping because that's what we can do, right? (laughs) So wait a minute. You have to tell my listeners about how you came up with throwing everything up in the air. Like, tell them them about the story with this man drinking milk and ice cream. Like, what? So in my (laughs) beginning of my hospice career, a couple of, it was last summer, actually, we had a patient who cardiac, end stage cardiac was sent home and was told family, he days to live, uncomfortable days to live, if that. So we get him home and everything, that's where I, I, I think everything was up in the air. We walked into so much drama and the wife is hysterical. There's a daughter showing up from somewhere else that hasn't been there in months. Um, it's just hysteria in this house. Meanwhile, the poor patient's there and we're trying to get him comfortable. But I, I, I just saw it when I walked in, it was just, everything was up. It was crazy. It was hysteria. It was Mm -hmm. crazy. And she's crying and he's upset. And, you know, we got him settled down in a couple of days. We settled down doing daily visits, getting the chaplain out there, doing all the right stuff. And then about a week in this, this gentleman who's pretty much in the bed, not really being very active with us. I hear sits up on the side of the bed and asks for milk and ice cream, which he is, of course, given. And then he proceeds to lay back down. So everybody gets super excited that maybe he's going to survive this and we're we're doing all the wrong things and a a rally, I think you called it. Um, And then about a week later, we're still doing daily care. He's quite comfortable. The family is just everything's just coming down. And it's, I, I went to see him, I think the day before he passed, everything is settled. They've got the mortuary picked out. They've talked to all the family. Everybody's visited. They're showing a video um, by his bed of different videos they had of the family so he can hear it. So beautiful, yes. beautiful. A family's visiting and the wife is no longer hysterical. And about two weeks in, she looks at me and she says, so when's he going to die? Diane. Like, they well, ask that. I, I, they I, do. Don't, I don't know. I, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I didn't know because he had had these weird rally moments. Um, but she was so comfortable at that point with even asking that question compared to two weeks prior. So we got two weeks with him and I got, we got stuff off that ceiling and he did die so peacefully. They did not even know he had passed. They were having dinner in the kitchen and she calls and says, yeah, I, I think he quit breathing a while ago. And he had, and it was quite comfortable. And, and we had just seen him a couple 
hours previous. So I think that's where I got that from was that in the beginning of my hospice career, just kind of walking into, holy goodness, how am I going to fix <laughs> this? Because there was so much drama going on. And to be told, you know, in the hospital, your husband's only got a couple of days left and you didn't even expect that or anticipate it. It's not like he had cancer. He had mm -hmm. end-stage CHF. He actually had end-stage heart failure. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's where I think I got that from. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, the drama and the chaos and the craziness that we're referring to, it's normal, you guys. Yeah. It is normal whether you're black or white or orange or whatever the other colors are in our country, we know. Um, families have a lot of psychosocial family dynamics when someone is dying, whatever is going on in your family right now, it's amplified when you've been in and out of the hospital or right. someone is dying. It, it just comes out. That's why they make movies about it, right. you know, turn it into comedy. So I don't want to make light of it, but that's what it is. And so we step into those situations and help you. But I love that story because it highlights a normal family moment and how someone slips away from their body, right? Right. He was in having that joy of listening to his family have yes, dinner absolutely. and all that stuff. Don't you want to go like that? Like yes, in the absolutely. loving environment? I've heard so many stories like that. So that is amazing. And I love how you said, um, when we turn the camera off, <laughs> how you're going to have your nurses, your new home health nurses spend a day yes. with the hospice nurse so they can just understand that world. And you're teaching them how to have those conversations early. Like right. that is just phenomenal. And, and we do need to do a better job in healthcare overall in our communication among the services, even the cardiologists with the pulmonologists or the nephrologists, home health, hospice, palliative care, we're all not communicating well, right? You know, I can remember reading notes where, you know, and we laugh about it on Twitter, I guess it's called X now, where they say the nephrologist is blaming the cardiologist, the cardiologist is blaming, blaming the pulmonologist, and that's just how it goes. So if we communicate better and just understand the continuum of care, I think things would go smoothly. I like what you said, slide to the other one. That's what I used to say. Slide yeah. over, yeah. slide over to palliative, slide over to hospice, <laughs> slide over to home health, whichever service meets your needs at the time. So thank you for just being yes. such a joy, looking fabulous in your thank new you. role, director role. <laughs> thank you, Dr. G. <laughs> I'm going to work we, hard. I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to do it, you know, for, for patient satisfaction and quality of care for not only them, but the families too. I think it's very, very, very important. Yes. We take care of patients and family. So thank you, Diane, and congrats you, on your new role. Thanks. Peace. <laughs>